Isn't this wonderful? We love our history in Beacon, don't we? Isn't this great? Okay. So I hope you agree that the Elks is a good location for us in that there's, there's parking, it's easy to get to. Um, we do have a flight of stairs. If anybody ever needs help, they tell me that there's a way to bring you in through the back in terms of wheelchair mobility or accessibility. So please don't let that be a reason why you don't bring someone who wants to be uh, you know, at one of our meetings. We're just getting a couple more chairs out and then we can get started. Anne, Anne, you have a seat up front. How's that for the spotlight? You know, I have a chair up here, and I can stand. It would do me good to stand. So if anybody needs an extra seat, then we are bringing some extra chairs out. All right, with that, let me officially call to order the September meeting of the Beacon Historical Society. If folks come down, Chris, would you please help them to find a chair, okay? appreciate your help very much and we'll, we'll just be accommodating it's a nice um, problem to have when you have a lot of folks who are interested in your programs if I have not met you yet my name is Denise Van Buren I'm the current president of the Beacon Historical Society we have several of our officers and trustees here tonight would they please stand so we can recognize them the Diane's are here any other of our trustees Gary very good we are all volunteer and we are grateful when you support us through membership in the Beacon Historical Society. It's about 25, well, it is $25 a year. And we have programs like this. We have a great newsletter. We have special events that we do. And by becoming part of the Beacon Historical Society, you are telegraphing that you appreciate the history of Beacon. You know, all these folks who have discovered Beacon and how special it is. Well, it's special because all of the great history in the buildings and everyone who went before us. So help us preserve and tell those stories so that real charm and essence of Beacon is not lost due to all the current development. Now I think that I've got you all settled in. Would you please rise so we can begin with a pledge to the flag of the United States of America. If you're able to play, stand, please do and join me with your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now you may be seated. Once again, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here at our September meeting, the history of the Newburgh Beacon Bridge. I do have a couple of announcements I'd like to make, and we do have one item of business that we need to complete tonight. But let me first um, tell you about some of the recent programming we've had. July, we had 100 people here for a discussion on the uh, growing up in Beacon. Raise your hand if you were with us in August. We took a trip across the ferry. Wasn't that fun on the ferry? We went across and um, enjoyed dinner with our speaker, Mary McTammany, the wonderful Newburgh historian who joins us this evening. We have tonight's program coming up on this Saturday. We have the launch, the premiere of our new urban renewal exhibit at our headquarters, which is the former St. Joachim's Rectory on Leonard Street. And then at 3.30, we're collaborating with the Howland Library with a lecture from a gentleman from New York State. Um, is it Diane Lapis at the library? Where does his... SUNY Albany, who's an expert on urban renewal in New York State, he's going to be giving a lecture down at the Hound Library at 3.30. So if that interests you, please, we'd love for your support. We also have coming up on October the 3rd at Two-Way Brewing, the next in our series of Hopped Up on History PowerPoint presentations, and that will be on the Mount Beacon Incline Railway. So I'm going to give it, be given this presentation, and I never got to ride the railway. So if you rode the incline, please come on down on October 3rd so you can share your stories with everybody who's going to be there. And I do want to tell you that um, we have an ongoing program now, and we have had more than, uh, I think about a dozen of them have been ordered so far. We have great new historic plaques that you can place on your home or building if you're a business. And I'm going to, um, Annie, 
my friend Annie, why don't you come up here and you can be like um, Vanna White and walk this around the audience for me. The more I love you, the more I put you to work. Everybody knows that, right? Um, we have new historic plaques in the city of Beacon again as we try to raise awareness to the really special history of this amazing community of ours. If your building, whether it's your commercial establishment or your residence is 100 years or older, you can order one of these great plaques. The Elks has ordered one. The Southern Duchess Country Club has ordered one. Um, private homes, Gary Barrick has placed one in his house. We started with the historic Manabred Homestead, the oldest building in Dutchess County. So we have two styles, an aluminum one, which is $250, or this is the bronze model, which is $350. So if you're interested in that, I have forms on the back table, as well as a few brochures on joining the Beacon Historical Society. So we'll leave that on the table. If you want to look at it on the way out, please um, feel free to pick it up and feel um, the weight of it. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. What does it say to all these people when they come to Beacon, when they see historic plaques on these buildings? We care. And these buildings matter. This is who we are. And so we hope you'll join us in this effort to raise awareness of, of Beacon's history. Thank you, Annie. Next, our item of business that we have to complete. October is the annual meeting of the Beacon Historical Society every year. So 30 days prior, we must tell you our incoming slate of officers and trustees. They will be published in our newsletter. As per Robert's Rules of Order, you have to give 30 days notice. And so I'd like to ask Gary Barrick, who chaired our nominating committee, if he would please rise and report on uh, the recommendation of the nominating committee. Mr. Barrick. Sure. You gotta really yell into this pizza. You might come out with some lipstick away on it. <laughs> uh, Madam President, on behalf of the nominating committee, the following slate has been recommended to serve as officers and trustees of the Beacon Historical Society for the calendar year 2024. Officers, President, Denise Van Buren, Vice President, Diane Murphy, Secretary, Barbara Sebrascia, and Treasurer, Anna Marcus. Trustees, Gary Barrick, Ann Foreman, Vicki Fox, Diane Lapis, Karen Meyer, Patrick Miskell, and Emily Murnane. Thank you, Gary. Are there any further nominations from the floor for either an officer or a trustee position for the Beacon Historical Society for the calendar year 2024? Hearing none, the chair declares the nominations are closed. And again, this slate of officers will be printed in the October edition of our newsletter. With that, what a joy it is for me, given this practically standing room only crowd to present to you our, spon our, our program this evening. Olive Cadet was with the New York State Bridge Authority and Kathy Burke is with the Historic Bridges of the Hudson Valley, which I believe is all volunteer. Is that right? No, I misspoke. It's a nonprofit. Okay, very good. And I have to tell you, when I reached out to them last year and I said, would you be willing to come and give us a history of the Newburgh Beacon Bridge? Olive did not hesitate. She said, sure, we'd be delighted to come. And I know you are all going to be delighted that you are here to hear it. So with that, who's going to start the presentation? Okay, Olive. How about a round of applause for these folks? Thank you. I'm Olive Cadet. I am a 24-year veteran of the New York City Bridge Authority. Um, I started there as an intern, and I have um, happily made my way to manager of special projects. So I get to do fun stuff like this. Um, <clears throat> I work very closely with Kathy Burke. I've been working with her since she wrote her first book. She came to our offices to dig up every picture she could find. Um, and she has been such an asset to the Bridge Authority. Um, so I'm very happy. ask you to just practically eat that microphone. Eat it. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> um, I'm very proud that I've been able to work with her and learn so much from her. So you're going to learn a lot of information about the bridge itself. But I just want to introduce you to the Bridge Authority, because I know a lot about that. Um, next slide. Um, common misconception about the New York State Bridge Authority is that we own all the bridges in New York State. So we get phone calls for every bridge 
we have five bridges and a walkway over the Hudson. Um, so <laughs> we maintain from the south, Bear Mountain, Newburgh, Mid-Hudson, Kingston, and then up north is, um, well, Kingston and Ripper up north. <coughs> Next slide. The uh, mission of the New York City Bridge Authority is to maintain and operate safe vehicle crossings over the Hudson River, entrusted to its jurisdiction, jurisdiction for the economic and social benefit for the people of the state of New York, and all of our visitors, too. We're not going to leave them out. Okay. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Um, the reason we exist is because people in the north, Catskills, uh, they wanted a bridge. And Governor Roosevelt was governor at the time. He vetoed the idea. He, there was no money. We just came out of the Great Depression. Um, but when he won his presidency, the first thing he did was create the Bridge Authority as a, um, <clears throat> a separate state entity, meaning we don't get state taxes, we don't get federal money, we don't get anything. We, every dollar that we spend on our bridges is from tolls. Um, next. So shortly after we were created to build the Rip Van Winkle Bridge, um, about a year later, uh, we were gifted the Mid-Hudson Bridge, since we are the New York State Bridge Authority. Um, this bridge opened in 1930. Um, it was built by the Department of Public Works. And um, it was about a year and a uh, le little less than a year we got it. Next slide. The Rip Van Winkle Bridge opened in 1935. It's our northernmost bridge. Um, it's, um, sorry. Um, what? Next slide. Um, 16 years after the Bear Mountain Bridge opened, it was gifted to us as well. It was owned by private corporation, Bridge Building Corporation and, the, and a separate family. Uh, so we got that in 1940. Next slide. We built the, the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge, and, and that opened in 1957. And then we have our baby bridges. Um, our North Span was our first span that opened. You're going to learn all about that. And our second span opened in 1980. The North Span is actually celebrating its 60th birthday this year um, on November 2nd. November 2nd. <laughs> and this is our. <laughs> This is our uh, favorite stepchild. Uh, <laughs> we also maintain the walkway over the Hudson, um, not the park. They, they maintain everything that's on the deck. We maintain everything under it, including the piers. And now I'd like to introduce you to Kathy Burke so she can tell you all about historic bridges of the Hudson Valley. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's tough to get this close enough. I, it's a wave if you can't hear me. Um, Olive is great, knows all kinds of stuff about the Bridge Authority, but the Bridge Authority wasn't gifted anything. Um, they did pay for the Mid-Hudson. They did pay for it. And when I say pay for it, they got the bonds and the, the debt to pay off the Mid-Hudson Bridge and the Bear Mountain Bridge when it was acquired. So nobody gifted the bridge. It seems like a gift, um, you know, and they do it for the state. So technically the state of New York owns these bridges, but it's the responsibility of the bridge authority to pay for them. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a dollar. <laughs> and there's no tolls on the walkway that go to the bridge authority. So you guys are also paying when you go on the bridge with your tolls to maintain the walkway as well, just so that you know what that toll money goes to. Okay, so I'm the director of Historic Bridges of the Hudson Valley. Um, it was set up to educate on the bridges because there's a lot of questions out there. You know, what are these bridges for? you know, which ones are our bridges and why do we have tolls when they were supposed to be gone, when the bridge was paid for, those kind of things. So it was set up to educate initially on the bridges and because I'm a retired teacher, I also brought in STEM education. So we do a variety of different things. And most of the time we do it at the Bear Mountain Bridge. Um, and these are pictures of inside 
in what used to be a garage of the um, administration building of the Bear Mountain Bridge. Um, and this is a group of master teachers. We also have, we have a class coming next week, um, 10th graders from a Yonkers High School that are coming to learn about STEM at the Bear Mountain Bridge. Um, and we're very fortunate. We have um, the chief engineer for the Bridge Authority with us today, and he's going to give you some information as well. Uh, but one of the things that um, Jeff likes to do, this is Jeff Wright, one of the things he loves to do really is talk to next generation of engineers and skilled labor, and that's what STEM is all about. Um, so that's really uh, the main reason for Historic Bridges now. Um, but we also have the Skywalk Arts Festival. We had it last weekend. Um, did any of you go there? It's all the way up in Catskill. Did you go? Yeah? Yeah? It's a really nice community event. Um, we run it. That was the seventh annual. Uh, we even ran it during COVID. We followed all the right paths and masks and all that kind of stuff. So it was a really nice experience. Um, and that's really what the Bridge Authority is all about, community. Um, these are people that live and work with us in the community. Um, so it's it really is a special thing. I've never worked for the Bridge Authority, okay? Um, but I feel like I do. All right, so here we go. Um, we have, um, when Denise had contacted Olive, um, she said there was a lot of interest in the fairies. So I don't usually talk all that much about the fairies, but we have some fairy information for you, and we also have a special present. I hope we have enough. Okay, good. Um, so there's been various, various ways to cross the Hudson River um, at this point between Beacon and Newburgh um, for a very long time. Um, and you can see some of the ways here. Um, oh, you removed the risky picture. <laughs> there were, we had a picture of a car driving across the ice, um, which was kind of a cool way to do it. Um, yeah. Was there ever a lighthouse here in Beacon? No. So it probably. So it, we won't tell the Senior Cousin website it was on, but they had it listed as happening between. Newburgh and Beacon, but I lived in Westchester for a long time, and I know what the Terrytown Royal House looks like, so that was it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so an official ferry uh, was established um, when Alexander Colden received a royal charter from King George II. Um, ironically, that this ferry was used to very greatly during the Revolutionary War against um, the next King George. Um, but the American Revolution brought national importance to the ferry. Um, most of the war, as you probably, I'm sure you all know, the British controlled New York City and a little ways north, maybe to Croton. Um, and north of Albany, uh, but could never capture this area. And we, this area, is the reason why we won the revolution. Um, so it was super important. <laughs> More beacon history, right? Okay, next slide. All right, so John Adams, George Washington, even Samuel Adams, um, and numerous others used the ferry to lead armies and complete important tasks. Uh, the crossroads nature of the area convinced Washington to set up his headquarters. Newburgh, or in Newburgh, not Beacon, who knows why, right? But um, the view, I know, probably the view. A better view of West Point, maybe. Um, okay, so the ferry made it possible to keep communications open between the Patriots in, in New England and um, the rest of the colonies, um, particularly in Philadelphia, um, which is pretty much where 84 goes now. Okay, so if you think about that kind of connection, it's a similar connection. Okay. All right, so the right to operate ferries between Beacon and Newburgh was given to the Ramsdell family. How many of you have, wrote, have, have um, been on the old ferry? Uh, lots of you. Okay, was anybody on the ferry the last day? Ooh, okay, I think you told me that before, Mary. Okay, all right, um, so they ran steamers north and south on the Hudson called the Ramsdell Line, operated the east-west ferry crossings through the Steamboat era until 1956 when the Bridge Authority took over the ferry service. Now, the Bridge Authority had done that with the Kingston Rhinecliff. They brought back the ferry, um, you know, all to kind of, make people 
more aware of that crossing kind of a thing. Um, but the ferry now has been replaced with that totally different type of ferry, but just as good. Okay, next slide. All right, um, is this where you're gonna hand out the gifts? Okay, we have one of these for each of you. One of the old um, tokens. Okay, we, there's a lot left in the Bridge Authority, uh, you know, safe there were the tokens but um so it was the newburgh ferry you guys i'm sure probably know more about this than i do but um fishgill landing is what beacon used to be called okay so it was the newburgh fishgill ferry and then became the newburgh beacon ferry and she can't pass out and move the key the thing so let me do this <laughs> Okay, so the last ferries, the Duchess, the Orange, uh, both were built in Newburgh shipyards, um, and the Beacon maintained ferry service until Sunday, November 3rd, 1963, one day after the bridge opened. I feel like I'm telling you guys things you already know at this point, but um, shortly after 5 p.m. that day, the Duchess and Orange met at Mid-River. Was anybody on those particular boats? Where they met at Mid-River for that? little ceremonies they signaled a final salute and formally passed the Newburgh Beacon Ferry into history after 20 220 years well until they brought it back when was when was this one brought back okay um, drivers paid two dollars to cross the Hudson on the ferry two dollars that's more expensive than the toll is now right and you only pay the toll one way okay um, and then they returned via the new bridge. Um, the orange, I don't know if she's got that on the next one. Yes, the Dutch and Be Duchess and Beacon were sold for scrap. The orange fought on for a little bit longer. It was used to ferry um, visitors from Manhattan to the World's Fair um, out in Queens in 64. Um, and then it was put to rest, I think, out at sea, actually, and is like a um, reef, a reef, kind of way out off of Long Island. All right, so then this should look familiar to you guys if you ever walk the bridge. Um, we have an interpretive sign that's gonna go up there as well, but the Beacon Long Wharf Bell served as a navigation aid to the ferry boats on the river between Beacon and Newburgh. Um, and then similar bells were on the ferry boats to aid navigation during fog and storms. Uh, in November 1988, the Bridge Authority relocated the bell to the toll plaza with a dedication on the 25th anniversary of the bridge's opening. So that's a long time ago already. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna, you guys almost done back there? I need my notes. Um, so the bridge construction began with a special ceremony by Governor Rockefeller. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Denise. Um, where he was uh, down on the water, and they called it the breaking of the waters ceremony, where he started up the drilling for the, the substructure of the bridge. And that was in, on, on October 26, 1960. And you can see some of the pictures here. Um, Olive did a great job setting up all this. Usually I have to do it myself, but since she's doing this with me, she was able to do it. Um, so here's the bridge. What she's done, we'll t set this up in, we talked about ferries. We're gonna talk about the construction of the north span, construction of the south span, and then redecking and widening of the north span, and then I'll let Jeff take over. Okay, so we have the piers that are on the, in the water and on the land, and then um, the truss structure we're gonna talk about, okay? All right, anybody recognize anyone in this picture? <laughs> you know, parents, grandparents, somebody. Um, yeah, <laughs> well I think they look like an awful lot of regular people too, I don't know, but, um, oh, is that what it is, Mary? See. That's what happens when you have Mary here, right? She has, she has the answers for us. Yeah? 
Okay. So what happened was the um, Newburg and Kingston, Newburg Beacon and Kingston wanted a bridge. Kingston won out. Um, I guess their politician was a little bit more powerful in Albany. Um, so Kingston Bridge was built. The Part of the um, charter with the uh, bridge authority under their law, they could only construct one bridge at a time, and Kingston won out. Um, so this is a group of Newburgh people in March of 57, right after the first opening for the Kingston Rhine Cliff, say, you know, they're going to climb on the bus and go to Albany and say, all right, it's time. Okay, we need our, we need our bridge. So um, the bridge was begun. This is uh, Bethlehem Steel. Um, this is like this. You could see it right there. Um, Bethlehem Steel Company fabricated and built the superstructure or the truss structure of the bridge, all the steel. Um, I have data for you, too, I think, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so this is a land pier, and you can see there's kind of a false work um, that holds up the structure. Hang on one sec. Um, which one are we on, Olive? 24, 25? Oh, the land piers are completed in February of 62, and the superstructure erection began, and that's what this is, and it started on the land. Um, there were four land piers. All right, so then, does anybody remember seeing this bridge go up? Okay, so what they did was they put all the piers in, um, and the piers were constructed, were constructed, I guess, built by um, Snare Dravo. Um, Snare also did the Kingston Rhinecliff, and I believe the Rip Van Winkle. Um, and once the piers were done, they started the truss structure. And they would start at each pier and work and cantilever out from the pier. Okay. Who knows what cantilever means? <laughs> cantilever. Yes. Oh, right. I know. We we were talking about that. How they they look like they're twins, um, but whenever I do a talk, I like to refer to them as fraternal twins because they look a lot alike, but they're not the same. Okay, a whole lot, and we're going to get into how they're different. Um, but let's see. All right, so one of the things about, um, if we've got a lot of similarities, we have some differences. One of the things about the first span, the north span, um, at about this time that it was being constructed, um, steel construction was going from using rivets to using bolts, okay? The first span of the Newburgh Beacon still used rivets. And it's kind of cool, one of the things I show the um, students and even some of the educators in workshops, on the old bridge, they still have rivets that held the steel together all these years. And when they widened it, they had new steel that went in and that went in with bolts. So they actually had a rivet buster that broke through the old rivets and then they were able to put in bolts to add the new sections. Okay, so this one, hang on one sec. All right, so uh, Bethlehem Steel fabricated 14,920 tons of steel um, for the superstructure. They shipped it by rail, Bethlehem Steel is is located in Western PA, where most steel is. And they shipped it by rail to New Jersey and then by barge up to the site. Okay. All steel, um, let's see. Oh, and then on top, if you can see it in the picture, they put tracks, like railroad tracks, and carts, and that's how they would move all the materials along. And then these guys out here, um, some of the, some of the um, engineers call them creepers because it kind of it's a crane that goes along and it'll pull the lift the things in. You know, I always say lift, but.
but engineers, you know, they'll say drop it in place. <laughs> I'm saying, but you had to lift it to drop it, right? But anyway, um, so that's how it was built. So they kind of came together at that section. Um, in the center, that's the through truss. And the through truss is a much bigger cantilevered section so that it can make room for, um, what do you call it? The, yes, the navigation shipping line, right, okay, the path, right. Um, and on the Newburgh Beacon, there's just the one. Uh, for the big ships to go through. Kingston Rhinecliff has two. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So the concreting of the roadway um, on the deck and the approaches began a little bit um, in the fall of 62, but then resumed in April. And then um, they were pouring the deck. They, when they poured the deck, they had to follow a specific plan so that it was balanced and didn't... Let me give you a better idea here. If you start in a beacon and you poured the concrete and you went all the way across to Newburgh, then you have the bridge is going to be unbalanced. So they would have to do... Because you probably watch the most recent project where they would do one section and then you'd be like why didn't they do this but then they did this section so it's kind of it makes sure that the bridge is not going to be unbalanced and fall over I guess but okay um, <laughs> do we have a question out there or just <laughs> concerned the bridge is going to fall over it won't I guarantee it it will not okay um, and then this is the sidewalk, finishing up the edge of the sidewalk, supposedly. It looks a little narrow for a sidewalk. Does anybody remember if there were sidewalks on the first bridge? Yeah, a maintenance walk. Um, but we'll get to that when we talk about the widening, when you get into the, where the um, through truss is. They had some issues when they were trying to widen it. Um, I drove across that old bridge, okay? And so anybody now that says, oh, I can't go across that bridge, it makes me nervous, it's too narrow. I'm like, what are you kidding me? Do you remember the guardrail? The guardrail was all of what, 15 inches high and it was the two rails like the side of the road, right? Okay, next one. I, yeah, well, it was it was pretty much. I guess I would understand how they felt when they were doing when the bridge authority was doing the decking on the north span, and they let anybody that came in 9D go across to Newburgh, and that was a little freaky at some at initially because it was literally open to the river next to you, and then you had the rail on the other side. Uh, even so, drive straight ahead, <laughs> and you're careful, and you'll be okay. All right, so here we are finishing up the roadway, and you can see it really does seem kind of narrow now. It was a little wider looking before you put it, you know, before you had all this other stuff on there, but um, yeah. Hang on one sec. All right, so the toll plazas were constructed during the summer and fall of 1963. And the original administration building was on the north side, okay? That building now, or has been since the opening of the south span, has been the maintenance building. So the maintenance, the maintenance guys on the Newburgh Beacon Bridge are tough people let me tell you okay <laughs> we know you know I've gotten to know a lot of them for because they help us with all kinds of things for historic bridges um, but there was one guy that had worked on the Newburgh Beacon for a very long time and he went down and before he retired he was the bridge foreman at the Bear Mountain and he said I can't believe it. If I need to stop traffic on the Bear Mountain Bridge, I step out and hold out my hand. 
And he said, if I tried to do that on the Newburgh Beacon, I'd be on the front of somebody's car out in Fishkill. Um, so yeah, so appreciate your maintenance guys on <laughs> maintenance people on the Newburgh Beacon Bridge. They work really hard. Um, but their building is going to get a little bit of a facelift and makeover, and, and Jeff's going to explain that. Um, because really, maintenance is what's kept all of these bridges in great shape. You know, people say, oh my gosh, there's a pothole. Yeah, I don't care about the pothole, so I want to make sure the steel is good. And you know Bridge Authority is taking care of that stuff. Okay. So here's Rocky um, at the opening of the North Span, uh, November 2nd, 1963. Um, it's funny how these kind of structures started getting opened and completed in November, early November. <laughs> uh, but there he is giving a speech, and he will cut a ribbon on the Beacon side, drive across the bridge, cut a ribbon on the Newburgh side, and then they all went for lunch at the Newburgh Hotel, which we all know isn't there anymore. Yes, yep, that's the Beacon side. Yeah, that Dutch Colonial right there, um, bridge manager used to live, well, there's a Dutch Colonial, they call it the barn now, but uh, the bridge manager used to live there. Okay. And this is your Newburgh Bridge. Did you know it was an award winner? Okay, um, so it was, let me get closer so I can read what it says. The um, American, what was it? Oh, right, read the caption. See what I mean? Olive helps me out here. Okay, so on March 5th, 1965, the Award of Merit by the American Institute of Steel Construction as one of the most beautiful steel bridges, long span bridges that were built that year. Aren't you proud? <laughs> okay, so everybody knew two lane bridge was not gonna get it done. Um, and there's all kinds of stories out there as to why that happened. Rockefeller gets blamed a lot. Um, but the, the federal funds kind of you know, dried up and became available again in, in uh, the late 70s and 80s. Um, and they were able to push through in 1975, I believe it was, um, the Federal Highway Administration approved a design, or the Bridge Authority, to get a design and construct a parallel span. Okay. Um, traffic, the first year, 25,000 cars a day. By 1976, that had quadrupled daily. I mean, it's incredible. And that's because of the completion of 84. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is, this is what's called the cash cow. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things also that had to be done in order to build this bridge, the federal government perch or gave, actually, let's see, we need to move on, Oliver? We, no, by special legislation of Congress, the bridge authority was authorized to collect tolls on an interstate bridge, okay? And that's an agreement that the bridge authority has only. Because there was a while back where there was talk about absorbing the bridge authority into something else, and there was some question as to whether or not that would still stand. In addition, all bridge authority bridges have to have the same toll. So we just referred to the Newburgh Beacon as the cash cow. If the tolls didn't have to be the same, I live in Newburgh, you guys live in Beacon. How much would we be paying for this bridge? Okay, so just one more thing to say thank you to the Bridge Authority for. 
Okay, next slide. So the South Span construction had many similarities to the North Span, but there are some major differences. We talked about the rivets and the bolts, so this one is steel bolts. Um, it's much wider. They're not really twins. If you go on the Beacon Shore or you go Grand Avenue is a really good spot to see both bridges. Um, this is significantly wider. So you can see here um, the approaches, the abutments, the superstructure, or excuse me, the substructure were all completed between May of 1976 and the end of late, or actually late 1978, steel style ink of Newburgh fabricated the caissons. Okay, so this was really a local project. And you'll see how local in just a minute. Okay. We got the right one here. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so this was um, American Bridge Company um, filed a permit, and this is part of their permit, to create an assembly yard on the west shore of the river in New Windsor. And what they were going to do is assemble pieces, parts of the bridge. So big chunks, big sections of the bridge were going to be assembled and brought into place, okay? Um, and this is more the way to do it now. I know I, I've sat on the, or I had sat on the Newburgh waterfront at a restaurant and seen parts of the Mario Cuomo go by. Did anybody see that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So kind of a similar thing. So next slide. And this is where the assembly yard was. It's still technically there. You know, you can go down and see, you know, steel style is there. Um, that whole area. But this here, this part, is going to be on the bridge. This is used to build that structure, okay? And you can see there's piles of steel, um, there's cranes. It was just like this big erector set, really. And then it would float upstream, up the river, and go right into place in the bridge. They would just lift it <laughs> and then place it down in sections on the bridge. Okay. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Okay. This is the last section being set right in there. Um, there's an engineer that works at the Bridge Authority, uh, George Fong. I don't know if anybody, he lives in Newburgh. Um, but he was working with a contractor for this bridge and then came to the bridge authority. George is way up on top of the structure, believe it or not. He sent me a picture that looks a little closer, but he was standing up there, if you could believe that, just watching as they lifted it in. So that's kind of a cool thing. Was anybody there that day? Yeah? That's not that long ago. Yeah. Did it really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're I'm sure you all have something, and you can keep the original. We just want a scanned copy, okay? So uh, you'll see our information at the end of the presentation. But it's all about collecting all of this information and the history and putting it where we can all enjoy it, okay? So don't hoard something. Make sure if you have it, we get it, okay? Um, but this is super cool. I love looking at the cars. Um, I actually lived in Newburgh at the time. Didn't even know this was happening, okay? Go figure. Um, but yeah, super important, okay? All right, so this is a great picture because it shows the roadway, roadway if I could talk, 
this time of night, I'd be good. Um, being constructed on the um, south span. This is looking south. You can see the traffic on the north span, and you can see the difference in colors. The north span was the silver, and the south span was the cordon steel, okay, that was supposed to not rust. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's rust colored, it was hard to tell, I guess, but they do paint it now. But I think it was a noble effort. Okay. All right. So this is just kind of a cool picture of stringers, right, Jeff? Was that? Yeah. Okay. I'm one of those that, that do hangy and whatever still. After seven years of doing this, you'd think I'd know some more engineering terms off the top of my head um, but there's this is where the concrete is going to go so this goes all the way across the bridge and they'll do that same thing they it's a little bit more advanced not surprisingly 17 years later um, when they concrete um, this bridge or this span go ahead sorry okay so here's the opening did anybody run across you did! Congratulations! All right, can we pick you out? <laughs> no kidding! Oh, very impressive! Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. Very cool. No, I don't, Frank, but we'll get one. <laughs> Definitely. My email's super easy, guys. kburke at hbhv.org, but you'll see it at the end. Um, but what they did was they started in Beacon, ran across the bridge, turned around, and ran back. Okay? Um, it was led by a motorcade that cut the ribbons, but then they ran over and ran back. Okay, and then the bike and pedestrian um, sidewalk was opened in 1981 one of only two on an interstate highway bridge. It's pretty unusual, but okay. So almost immediately after the south span opened, the north span closed to widen and strengthen it. Okay, so all the traffic shifted to the south span, um, and they started taking apart the old bridge, um, and they didn't just, you probably go to the next slide, Olive. They didn't just resurface it and make it a little wider. If you have a wider bridge, you need a bigger abutment. Okay, anybody know what an abutment is? You do? Raise your hand and tell me. Yeah, you. <laughs> okay, so the abutment connects the roadway of the bridge, the deck of the bridge, to the ground. Okay, and it, it stabilizes and strengthens. Is that about right? Okay, good. <laughs> so they had to rehab this one to make it sufficient for the wider bridge. Yeah, I know, I know. We do, uh, you'll see the huge differences in, um, oh, you'll see a good one in a few minutes, um, safety regs, you know, and, and all the different things that they do now. Um, okay, so again, super important. They weren't just widening it, widening it, they were making it stronger and last longer. So for all intensive purposes, we ended up with almost a new bridge, okay? Um, and that's a bridge authority thing to do. The, anybody go across the, um, what is it up there just north of the rip? Castleton. Anybody been across the Castleton lately? Castleton opened three years before our North Span. Hasn't had a whole lot of care, and it carries 90. So these are safe bridges. That's what I keep coming back to. So we have some older steel that's in, still in great shape. Anything that was not in great shape was replaced, and extra stringers were added for more strength. And then what they did was cantilever out, cantilevers again, off of the deck for the widened section because they needed to gain about a lane, really. And this is where you can kind of see the cantilevered off. Um, they could do that everywhere except 
where the through truss is, where the through truss is, that road deck goes right up to those to the through truss. There, if you next time you drive across the bridge, take a look. It's right there. Okay, there is no leeway anymore at all at that point. Okay. Um, this is the cementing, the bridge deck. Uh, let me get the facts on here. Hang on one sec. Those things have a 400 foot conveyor belt for concrete. Okay. And what it did was it laid a layer of six and a half inch high concrete, lightweight concrete. Um, you know, concrete's a big thing in the the news now can we make it lighter and cleaner and all kinds of things um, but light on a bridge really makes a big difference okay um, and then on top of that there was an inch and a half of a latex concrete that helped to protect the road surface because you know all the trucks that are going across this thing okay and this is the picture I was talking about, <laughs> this guy. That's a nice wide surface, but raise your hand if you want to go up there and paint, okay? Um, yeah, so there he is. He does have a helmet on, Jeff, so that's a you know, good thing. Uh, but <laughs> is it a bandana? I can't tell from here. But what they were doing was painting the bridge to match the brown of the cordon steel of the southern of the um, south span. <laughs> you don't like the brown, <laughs> really? <laughs> I th I think it's kind of unique. You know, people always ask me which is your favorite bridge. You know, and if I say Newburgh Beacon, they look at me like, "What are you kidding me?" You drive across those bridges, you have a view like you've got nowhere else. No matter what the weather is like, the sky is gorgeous, okay? And how many times do you go across the bridge that one of those big planes that are going to land at Stewart are following along with you? It's just an incredible spot. It really is. Um, and yes, it's a better view than the Catskills from the Kingston Ryan Cliff, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. Oh. <laughs> so let's go with, let's look at the sunset as the pink from the brown bridge, I guess, right? Um, but they're still, they're still beautiful bridges. Okay. All right. Um, and then this is, I think, are we up to opening day? There we are. Okay. So again, um, not a whole lot of fanfare because it wasn't really opening day. It was reopening day. Um, and people, I think, were more excited to just be able to use both bridges again. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> to a more recent time. Um, but yeah, so they again started in Beacon, went across to Newburgh. Um, there were a few speeches. Um, NFA got to play, I guess, because they started in Newburgh. NFA got to be, be the band. Um, but so that was November 1st, 19. Whoops, I'm sorry. This is the, the it's June 2nd of 1984. Okay. And then I think I'm about done. And now it's going to be Jeff. Did anybody have any quick questions on the history part? I could, but he could probably do it better. <laughs> one thing about one thing about the caissons, and it's it's funny because I don't know if any of you follow historic bridges on Facebook or we have a website. Um, there was a tipped caisson on the Mid Hudson Bridge that almost made that project moot because they could not get it to write up. I mean, think about it. It was back in 1927, okay? Um, and it tipped, it listed, I guess you would call it. Um, and Majeski, Ralph Majeski, had partnered with um, Daniel Moran, particularly because he supposedly knew the bottom of the Hudson River in that area because he'd done the piers on the 
railroad bridge. Okay. And what happened was it kind of, they, they did this funny thing. When you have a case on, you fill different sections and you're sinking it and it, and you put, you know, the sides up. I have a diagram back there on the, on the interpretive signs that we did on the Newburgh Beacon. So if you really want some more information, it's back there. But the, um, the Newburgh Beacon, the South Span, had a tip case on too. And they were able to write it in three weeks, okay? Because they could use a hydraulic jack, you know, all those kind of things. So, but same thing. I mean, that's one of the things I love about teaching this stuff is kids think the river is like a pool you know underneath the water is just a nice smooth little area it's not okay and the engineers try to take all of that into account but you know there's no way they can see that at the bottom and get all those things uh, but yeah so Aside from the fact that the caissons for the south span were fabricated here in Newburgh, um, what other kind of things would you like to know? Yeah. How far down did the caisson go? Did you sitting on the ground? It's on, it's on, yeah. It's not on bedrock, but you don't you don't need the whole. I don't want to. He's coming up now anyway, so let me help him. Yeah, so we're good. I know. We'll we'll get through this. So yeah, the the caissons are founded on stable material. So depending on where your stable material is, that's how far down the caissons have to go. There's also, uh, they use steel piles also on the Newburgh Beacon bridges that are then driven down to a, a stable area. Usually when it's deeper than where caissons would normally go, they would install steel piles and, and then uh, build off of them. So, <clears throat> so some of our more recent projects, uh, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with our, the deck jobs we've done since 2012. Uh, we started with the south span redecking and then uh, just recently completed the north span uh, redecking project. And fortunately, we used the same idea that they used back in uh, the, the late 70s there when they widened the bridge and we threw all the traffic over on the south span uh, to be able to uh, really cut down on the construction time required to redeck the north span. Um, Let's see, uh, other projects we've done, uh, we raised the 9W overpass. Uh, we were having a lot of hits down there uh, to, to have it meet the current standards of 16 feet. Uh, we, we rose the bridge about two and a half feet uh, down there. Uh, that was prior to the North Span redecking project. Um, go ahead, Olive. Uh, here you can see some of the North Span work that was done. We had a lot of uh, different uh, potholes we had to take care of before we finally got to our project. Uh, again, that's all just trying to get toll uh, um, in, improvements and, and uh, getting our toll increases in order to be able to afford to uh, put the new deck on. Um, here you can see the new gantry going up. Uh, we replaced all of our toll booths, as you probably know. Uh, we have the all electronic tolling going on now. Uh, so uh, it's not necessarily something we were totally excited about. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, people go through and never pay tolls now, but uh, we do the best we can. Here you can see uh, the difference between the original uh, toll booth plaza area on the left picture 
And then on the right picture now, how it looks without having to stop and, and pay a toll. Uh, we saved about uh, 20 to 25 percent of the accidents that used to occur no longer occur because people aren't uh, running into the back end of people stopped or trying to switch lanes to get to the quickest toll lane. Uh, so that's been a good thing. Uh, and of course, uh, it really has helped cut down on traffic at the Newburgh Beacon Bridge. Uh, not so much at the Mid-Hudson Bridge because we're still going from two lanes into one lane during rush hour. So we're kind of stuck there. Okay, I'll have... Here's just a beautiful view uh, be between the bridges on the Beacon side looking towards Newburgh. Um, it's a great view we have on our on our property, and uh, it's it's just a gorgeous facility. Okay. Um, is anybody familiar with John Gould? Okay, does anybody have the old tiles from the 50th anniversary? Okay. Um, Robert Gould, who actually taught at NFA, um, or actually maybe the middle school, um, is one of John's sons. Um, Robert just celebrated his 80th birthday, actually. Uh, but he sells his father's art. Um, and I thought you guys might be interested in accessing his um, work. This is a, a painting that he did of the last fairy. And the thing about John's work is they always has the gulls um, or the doves and the eagles birds in his paintings. He has a lot of historic paintings of Newburgh too, of um, Washington's um, headquarters. Um, so, and here's the ferry over there in the old Newburgh ferry spot there um and then these are the tiles uh the beer mountain is celebrating its hundredth year uh next year um so we're gonna have robert is helping to make some tiles for the centennial of the bear mountain bridge um but we'll have those available do we get the one oh this is the website in the back is a booklet if you want to take a quick look through it um, and two samples of what you can get. They have a really nice website, um, but it's johngouldart.com if you want any of that. Um, and then we have a special print, frame print, that we are, HBHV is gifting to the Beacon Historical Society. Okay, and it has all of our bridges, the Bear Mountain, the twin spans. Uh, this is the Clearwater, uh, Mid Hudson, the railroad bridge is there, Kingston, and the Rip. Okay. This was, you know, it's, if we, yeah. Right. Graphic artist, yeah. 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 Right. So um, these are actually sources. So um, I, did, I had to do a lot of research about our fairies because I wasn't really familiar with them. So um, if you wanted to read the articles yourself, there's some stuff here from Cena Hudson, Hunt Apples, um, the Hudson River Maritime Museum. And then there's just our websites there. And for those of you who are not aware, the Bridge Authority actually purchased the ferry when they knew they were going to be building the bridge. And so how long did you actually operate the ferry? Do you know? 56 to 63. And so you, I'm sure, probably have an archive of things related. We're thrilled. How, isn't that nice to get your ferry token? Isn't that grand? Thank you for that. Thank you for a marvelous presentation. We feel so fortunate.
And just just to be clear, today about how many vehicles cross the Newburgh Beacon Bridge, roughly? What's the? <laughs> it's your busiest span, clearly. How is it compared to other bridges in New York State? Is it right up there? Right. Okay. So we have to compete with that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, at one point, you used to figure, you said it was 25000 a day. Right. Did you hear that? There's a $16 toll if you want to go down and try the GW instead of yeah. going locally. So, well, wasn't this just wonderful? Please give them a big round of applause. I did want to ask if in your archives, if you happen to have any photographs of the properties, the homes, the buildings that were on the Beacon side, the Fishkill side, when you, um, because there was a house there, Spookfields, and I believe what you refer to as the Dutch colonial residence of the bridge director was perhaps their barns? Yeah, it was a carriage house. It was a carriage house for a big estate. Do you have a picture of that estate? Because I am dying to get my hands on it. One of the reasons Historic Bridges was formed was the Bridge Authority really didn't have much archives. Um, they were really created to fund the bridges, not so much, you know, all this other stuff. Um, and this is kind of a new thing. And the bridges are such an important part of the Hudson Valley um, that now we're trying to compile all this stuff. So anything you guys have, again, make please make sure that you contact us, yeah, um, and send it to us. Did someone have a question? Yes, uh, we're recording this. I always post it on our, both our website and our social media. You can always see it afterwards. So thank you so much for a thought-provoking and informative presentation. We're very grateful and um, so fortunate that you took time out of busy lives to come tonight. We're, we really appreciate it. One more round of applause for the folks from Historic Bridges and the Bridge Authority. Just a, a, a couple of announcements. We are gearing up for Thursday, November 9th, our seventh annual Beacons of History Award. This year, we are honoring not only Ian and, and posthumously Joanne McDonald, who are well-known uh, local Beaconites and have been very generous donors to the Beacon Historical Society, but also our Beacon volunteer firefighters, right? Come out. Help us recognize these men and women who are heroes in our own neighborhoods and um, who have really had a very challenging year with some developments that are occurring within the city of Beacon. So that's November 9th. If you did not, because you're not a member, get an invitation in the mail. There are some on the back table. I encourage you to take it, but I also encourage you to send in your reservation like ASAP. We've already got about 145 or 50 tickets already spoken for, and we only have 220 seats, and it's November 9th. Everyone typically waits to the last minute can't do that this time folks okay so we hope to see you on november the 9th we have all that great urban renewal programming coming your way in october watch your newsletter for that and do not miss these wonderful display boards that the bridge authority folks have brought with you i'm sure they'll be happy to stay and answer any questions as you enjoy those and then our our final closing message is the fact that don't feel you have to but the elks have very generously said anyone who would like to stop upstairs and um, perhaps have a, a drink of choice uh, at the bar you are welcome to do that that is not normally open to people who are not elks but um they do not charge us to come here they have opened their doors to us they've been very generous to us and um, i just wanted you to know that you are welcome to stay and have a libation should you choose to do so all right any other closing remarks before we finish all right hey great things are happening in the city of beacon in terms of history right give yourselves a round of applause and thank you for being here